I don't know what triggered this, but something has happened because the ATF is sending out more letters than I've seen in a while. We are the Armed Attorneys. Today, we are talking about an update with regard to FRTs, wide open triggers, and the like. We have seen kind of a disturbing trend at our firm. We've seen a ramp up in ATF enforcement recently, and it's worth discussing because the numbers are changing, and um, it's been about a year since we talked about this last, and I think it's wow. important for folks to kind of be reminded about what to do. Should you find yourself in possession of one of these things, what happens if you're contacted by law enforcement? What if they show up to your house with a warrant? Uh, but before we begin, show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting that like button. And what started all of this was the ATF reclassification of what they considered a machine gun. They had a a letter dated March 22nd, 2022. Um, and that letter and, and what we see going forward in the change of the Code of Federal Regulation, uh, tell us very briefly, I mean, what's going on with machine guns? More of the same from the ATF, but essentially we are taking the definition of machine gun in the United States Code. We are altering it in the CFR to make it more expansive and throwing forced reset triggers into this definition, even though alleging that a force reset trigger is one trigger pull to multiple rounds expelled is a stretch, less of a stretch than a bump stock, but still a stretch. And yet here we are. So we have a mass confiscation of force reset triggers of all different brands, shapes, and sizes now. And we saw a huge um, initial push, right, from the ATF to confiscate these items from the individual. And then, I mean, I would say definitely the last four months or so, crickets. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was pretty quiet. And I'll, you know, this is all anecdote, but we were getting contacted maybe once a week or two times a week. And More. just Yeah. And just recently, we've seen a gigantic uptick. I want to say maybe 10 just this week. And folks who have been contacted by the ATF requesting that they essentially turn over these devices as unregistered machine guns. Um, and so we need to kind of talk about what the logistics look like, you know, for a person in possession of maybe something that looks like this. Now, we have our general prohibition on the possession of machine guns in 18 U.S.C. 922 And what does that tell us? Well, it says that you cannot possess a machine gun. You can't transfer one. You can't have one. And um, there are some exceptions to this. But generally speaking, machine guns are hot lava. And machine gun is only the part of the gun that actually makes it fire more than one round from one trigger pull, which means that if you only had a full auto sear wearing it like a necklace around your neck, you are in illegal possession of a machine gun, even though that sear by itself won't do anything. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because we look at other NFA items like short barreled rifles or short barreled shotguns or AOWs, and we see the disassembled, let's say these things are wholly disassembled, just this combination of parts doesn't make a unregistered item. Correct. Machine guns, exact opposite. Exactly. You know, integral opposite. Par part of the machine gun, that's the machine gun. Yes. Now, there are exceptions to this. There are law enforcement exceptions, as there always are. And, of course, the exception that we've always had since May 19th, 1986, which is that it was lawfully owned, registered before that date under the National Firearms Act. So you've got your tax stamp. You cannot cure an unregistered machine gun. So let's say that you um, happen to find one in grandma's attic. That happens more often than you think. It really does. And people call us and they say, oh my gosh, there's this wonderful war relic that apparently we have and I'd like to make it legal. And what can you do, Richard? Well, you get in your DeLorean and you go 88 miles per hour. <laughs> no, I mean, the, unfortunately, you're out there's of luck. There's nothing. No, you're out of luck because, you know, like we, we don't have time travel. You can't go back to before May 19th, 1986 and register this thing and get it legal on the book. So, and that's what the ATF, when they're looking at FRTs, when they're looking at devices that they now consider machine guns, especially these things that were developed, you know, far after that date or manufactured after that date, it makes it a pretty clear cut case of in the eyes of the ATF um, that this thing is an unregistered machine gun. It'd be easy to develop probable cause, things like that. If you are one of these people who thinks that this is something that applies to you now or should perhaps apply to you, and you have not seen our previous video on the issue, go back. We're going to post it here. Take a look. We go through technical definitions. That's a really helpful discussion. But really, this is by way of they are ramping up 
more and more people are going to find themselves in the situation. So this is your reminder about what to do if the ATF contacts you and says, you're in unlawful possession of a machine gun and we want it back from you. What should they do, Richard? Yes. I mean, the first thing is, is speak to an attorney. There are and there's a ton of great lawyers out there. And so find somebody, you know, shopping for a lawyer, mm-hmm. I, I think, think about working with any other professional, somebody you can work with, somebody that you can trust, you have good communication skills with. Lots of qualified folks out there to act as this intermediary because, and the ATF is, I mean, this goes for all law enforcement, not just the ATF, but why it's so important to have an attorney intervene is, you know, they can act as that barrier. The things that your attorney says can't necessarily be held against you. They can work on, you know, how we disclose. They can talk about the possible courses of action, the pros and cons of each of those things and let you make an informed decision about what's best for you. Yeah. And I will say, um, you know, don't sweat too much because at this point we have seen lots and lots of ATF interactions with these items, lots and lots of FRTs turned over. And I have seen, and this is just me, I have seen exactly zero prosecutions of just the guy who bought the trigger. Yeah. I probably wouldn't lay awake at night over this stuff. No, Uh, you need to cure what's happened, but you're, you don't sweat too much. Right. And so, um, to, to Emily's exact point, and this isn't a an endorsement of just, oh, just be bopped down to the local field office and toss them your FRT. I mean, you still need to talk to mm-hmm. an attorney, but I don't think people should be losing sleep over this no. because we see the lack of prosecutions at this point. But I don't know what triggered this, but something has happened because the ATF is sending out more letters than I've seen in a while. Yes. And so we got to talk about it. We have, let's say... Your person, maybe you possess one of these things, maybe you don't possess one of these things, but you get a letter from the ATF. Um, what are these letters saying generally? They're generally saying um, you are in illegal possession of an item, you need to contact us, and you need to turn it over. Don't panic when you get that letter and throw the item away. Don't do anything that would constitute tampering with evidence. But at that point, you need to be ready to you know, write yourself with separating yourself from the item. And what we see is, you know, once you get that letter, I mean, you're on notice that an investigation is mm-hmm. in progress or proceeding. And so obliterating the item, throwing the thing in the river, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, hiding it, concealing it, that that could all be obstructing under federal law and probably a crime under state law as well. So just be very, very careful. All right. So what happens if we have, instead of getting a letter, we get a knock at the door and we have ATF there? Mm-hmm. Hide your dog. <laughs> but then, yes, um, do not consent to any searches. Do not let them in voluntarily. Get the agent's card. Let them know that you are happy to be cooperative, but you must first consult with your lawyer. Most importantly, do not consent to anything. Do not give them any information. Do not confirm that you, in fact, do have possession of any item. Simply thank them for their time, get their information, and let them know you will be back in touch with your attorney. Yeah, and this is one of those things where you less is more Mm -hmm. uh, because very, very small, innocuous, maybe statements could be used to corroborate a search warrant. So, hey, do you buy gun parts online? Yeah, every now and then. That might be enough to corroborate hey, we think that this person has something that we think is worth searching for. Um, So don't make any statements like that, obviously. Don't give them an inch. Yeah, don't give them an inch. Be polite, be professional, but, you know, let them know you're going to talk to them through a lawyer. Now, let's say we made a, um, maybe we slipped up, maybe we said something um, inadvertent, and now the police now aren't just knocking, but they have a search warrant. That changes things a little bit. What does that look like? Yes. So there is nothing you can do in that moment to win and have them not execute that search warrant. It doesn't mean that the search warrant is necessarily good or valid. However, that battle is not won at the moment of execution. You may ask to see it, but otherwise you must step aside and let them execute it. And I know that really bugs people because they're like, what if the the warrant sucks? You know, Mm -hmm. that is what happens in the courtroom later. So um, any good criminal defense attorney knows what is a sufficient search warrant, knows how to challenge that warrant. And if the warrant is sufficiently challenged, it will be thrown out. And the fruits of that warrant, which is whatever they have confiscated, will also be thrown out and they cannot be used in a prosecution against you under most circumstances. Yeah. So for a search warrant, it's a, I'm not consenting to the search, but I'm not going to interfere with your investigation and step into the side. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's really important. And I think this is kind of a backdoor. I think police actually do this intentionally sometimes. Um, is they they try to get consent in conjunction with a warrant. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a good hedge against a bad warrant. Right. So still, it's really important if they are executing a warrant, not consenting to a search, mm-hmm. because let's say the warrant is bad, well, then they fall back on your consent to search. And so that's an important kind of lesson for folks. Now, I think that's our FRT update. 
Do we have any other up? Emmy life update. Yes. So for those of you who are very perceptive and have noticed that I am changing clothes and also gaining weight, thank you for commenting about my weight gain. Is Emily pregnant again? Yes, she is. <laughs> um, there will be another armed attorney baby. Again, not with Richard. Half people think that Richard and I are married to one another. We We're married, have, but to separate people. To separate people. So yes, you will see less of me come this summer. And um, we are very, very excited for our little our little bundle of joy on the way. But well, we brought this up because we saw um, the comments about FRTs. We have been contacted by folks about getting these letters. Um, we want to know what y'all's experience is. Does this answer all of your questions? If you have additional questions, we'd like to hear from you. But we hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, consider subscribing, hitting that like button, and help us fight the anti-2A algorithm by sharing this video. And as always, question and comment for us below. Until next time, we're the Armed Attorneys. <laughs>